Okay, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who is here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, for the folks that are here in person, I'd also like to thank everybody that is joining us via our YouTube live stream. Hello um, to those who are joining us virtually. Um, you're here for the next seminar in our CNR Spring Seminar Series titled History, Successes, and Challenges in Natural Resources Decision-Making. Today we are featuring our Dean Emerita of the College of Natural Resources at UWSP, Christine Thomas. Um, but before we get into our, our introduce our speaker, I would first like to just go through a few acknowledgments and say thank you to everybody who has made this seminar series possible. Um, I would like to first of all thank my, uh, my supervisor and director of the Wisconsin, Trap <clears throat> excuse me, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, um, at UWSP here, Scott Hingstrom. Uh, he has helped a lot with making this uh, and, and planning this seminar series and making contacts and, and talking to our speakers and so forth. And of course, um, and he is also an extension specialist. So a lot of what we do is geared towards bringing wildlife science and natural resources science to the public. So I'd like to thank the um, extension folks as well. And of course, the College of Natural Resources for making this possible. Um, next, I would like to go through um, a land acknowledgement that we like to that we like to do whenever we have a public engagement. Um, we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all Indigenous peoples. So next, we still have three remaining seminars coming up in our seminar series. Um, we have, of course, we are, have Christine Thomas joining us today. Uh, next week, we have Dan Bauman, who's the Secretary's Director for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, uh, North Central Section. And um, so please consider uh, joining us next week. And then after that, we have Greg Kazmierski, Chair of the Natural Resources Board, joining us. And finally, uh, John Greendeer, uh, who is a former president of the Ho-Chunk Nation. He will be joining us on, the, on April 27th. Um, those will also be live streamed via YouTube as well. For those of you that are joining us via uh, YouTube, um, there is a chat feature where you can ask questions. So if you are logged into your YouTube account, you will be able to put questions into the chat box and we, we will read them off to our speaker at the end. Um, so, so please, um, thank you again for joining us. And I would like to invite Jason Riddle, our professor at, at uh, UWSP, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Do you have to push anything on this or just hold it? No, just hold it. All right. All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. <laughs> Good. All right. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas today. Um, if I were to go through all of her accomplishments, there'd be no time left for her talk. So I'll hit on a few, and then I'll share a personal story that'll do my best to keep under 15 minutes. Um, so uh, Dr. Thomas obviously was a professor here in the college and uh, was dean for several years, at 10 of which uh, I was here for. Um, but she, uh, during that time, also developed the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program, uh, which is now an international program uh, educating women on how to gain outdoor skills. Um, under the George W. Bush uh, presidency, she was appointed to the Sporting Conservation Council, uh, so basically a presidential appointment to serve at a federal level. And then at the state level, uh, Governor Doyle appointed her to serve on the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board, and she continued to serve on that board into the Walker administration. I bring those up just to point out that she uh, has been asked by folks on either side of the aisle to represent natural resources uh, in a policy-making arena. Um, in the non-agency world, uh, she is a professional member of the Boone and Crockett Club. She sat on the board of directors for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and uh, also serves Ducks Unlimited, where she's currently the senior vice president for conservation. So again, I could go on and on, but what I really want to share is what I'm calling a mentorship memory. Uh, because while I've always had really good bosses, um, the bosses here in the CNR, our deans, are you know not just our employers, but they're our mentors. And uh, there's a, a moment that is pertinent for uh, today's subject. Um, years ago, uh, Christine invited an undergrad, she was an undergrad research fellow named Rachel Conkle, 
invited Rachel Conkle and I to join her at the North American Fish and Wildlife Conference, which if you've ever been, is like the suit and tie version of a fish and wildlife meeting because the folks in attendance in this are heads of agencies at the state and federal level and the Secretary of Interior is there and it's well, you know, not the place that most, uh, <laughs> most fish and wildlife faculty show up to. Um, but we were there because our undergrad, Rachel, had been asked to present her undergrad research from here to an invitation only meeting of the Boone and Crockett Club. This is a pretty big deal. And uh, Chris invited us to go along. And while we're at this meeting, uh, Chris invites us to the Science and Policy Committee meeting that was on chronic wasting disease. And then she's introducing us to agency heads and then the Boone and Crockett members, some of whom are probably millionaires or billionaires. And then we're at this black tie dinner. And uh, the whole time, Christine is moving seamlessly from one stakeholder group to another. Kind of, and one minute she's wearing a becoming an outdoors woman hat, another minute a professor hat, another minute the dean's hat. I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you wear so many hats and still maintain your authentic self in all of these different contexts? And while she's doing that, she's introducing uh, Rachel and I to these folks and kind of creating space for us to make our own connections. And uh, it dawned on me uh, that this was really Christine's habitat, <laughs> right? This was like her space. And uh, from that moment on, um, anytime she would give me advice, you know, as my boss or as the dean, I knew that it wasn't just her perspective from the top of the CNR hill, but that she had been on many hills and seen the conservation landscape from a lot of perspectives. And uh, I think that ability to sort of see things from a lot of different lenses um, is part of what uh, has made you so effective in your career and also what certainly um, sets you up to give this talk with lots of uh, authority. So thank you. Let's see if I can get this right. Supposedly goes on the lapel. I don't know that I can do that. All right, well, we'll just hang on to it. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so I uh, did the work that I'm going to talk to you about today as um, my dissertation my doctoral dissertation, so some of you may have seen it. And I'm gonna just use this to, to uh, set us up here for talking about natural resources policy in Wisconsin now, which if you've been paying attention is highly contentious and very controversial and lots of stuff going on. Um, and uh, so this is probably the only policy making role that I had. The Sporting Conservation Council that Jason mentioned, which was followed by the uh, Wildlife Hunting Heritage Conservation Council where the Obama administration appointed me as vice chair. So the total of those two things, I probably spent, uh, uh, let's see, eight and six, probably 14 years doing that. And I spent uh, 11 years on the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board and uh, three as its chair. But the, the Wildlife Hunting Heritage and the Sport and Conservation Council, those were advisory to the um, Secretaries of Interior and the Secretary of Agriculture. So you could get your oar in the water on policy, but you weren't actually making it. And then the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board, which is a high authority board, you um, are actually making natural resources policy. And then in my role in both Boone and Crockett and Ducks Unlimited, I sit on their policy committee, so I have an opportunity, again, to get the ore in the water from a conservation group um, standpoint. So I've had lots of opportunity to go lots of great places and meet lots of wonderful people and have lots of fun um, in my natural resources life. But let's talk about the history of the Natural Resources Board in Wisconsin. Um, so Wisconsin 
uh, is and was a land of valuable natural resources. And when Marquette and Joliet first saw it in 1673, it was beautiful, it was breathtaking, it was pristine, and it was bountiful. Um, and uh, Marquette and Joliet noted the natural resources, and it didn't, that part of why they were there. They were there to save souls, and they were there to report back on what could be taken from the land in the new world. Okay, so they reported back on what could be taken from the land in the new world, and it didn't take long to bring those who were interested in exploiting those natural resources and making a life for themselves. And it didn't take too long for the weight of European civilization to become heavy on the land. Uh, the loggers, trappers, and hunters, many uh, came here. Um, Governor Fairchild, uh, in his address to the Paris Exposition in 1867, said, everything possible should be done to attract as many Europeans as possible to Wisconsin are countless, countless, means, it, countless is a meaningless word when you're talking about natural resources, right? You may not uh, be able to count them, but there are a limited number, okay? So countless uh, um, acres, uncultivated land, numerous water privileges, yada, yada, yada. In other words, they were advertising for immigrants to come to Wisconsin. And they did come. Uh, but even before that, in 1854, a prominent Wisconsin scientist increased Lapham. Some of you from the greater Milwaukee area may have heard of Lapham Peak. Well, this is named after Increase Lapham. He was urging the protection of forests. And in 1867, he convinced the state legislator to establish a citizen board, the Forestry Commission to look at the effects of de forest destruction in Wisconsin. This was the beginning of citizen involvement in natural resources decision making. That first uh, commission was made up of Lapham, J. Gillette Knapp, this guy here from the Horticulture Society, and Hans Crocker, an Irish immigrant, railroad mogul, and prominent Malik Milwaukee politician. So think about that. Uh, you had the guy, the scientist, okay, and then you had a guy from the Horticulture Society, and this guy here owns the railroad, and they're moving logs out of the north, right, to Chicago and other places, and he's on the Forestry Commission. And this is not unusual that there, uh, through the years, on the boards and commissions, there would be academics, there would be scientists, but there would also be special interest groups, and there would be people who were just interested in natural resources because they were hunters and anglers, so uh, not unusual to have these folks on the board. So in spite of, I'm gonna back up here for a second, in spite of this enlightened group, and this enlightened group predicted everything from soil erosion to climate change in 1867. The state legislature's response to the sky is falling was, okay, we're gonna do tax credits for planting shelter belts around farm fields, okay? And so this is, a, a, um, as we talk about natural resources policy, a shortage of anything, the first response is what? The first response is make more, okay? And you're gonna see that as a theme uh, throughout. The last response always is what? Take less, okay? First response, make more. Last response, take less, okay? Um, similarly, the Great Lakes fishery was undergoing exploitation. By 1874, there were funds available um, from the federal government that resulted in the establishment of a fisheries commissions. So why did these happen? Money came from the federal government to establish fish commissions and their job was to take the federal money and build fish hatcheries. And why were they building fish hatcheries? To make more, okay? Um, 
And why did they need to make more? Well, this is a little fact I ran across when I was doing my research that just um, floored me. This was in the Fisheries Commissioner report from this time period. In 1874, there were enough gill nets in Lake Michigan to stretch from Michigan to Wisconsin, uh, or from, um, and also from Badenoch down to Indiana Dunes. So you could, there were enough nets, this is 1874, so you could keep a fish from swimming across the lake. Okay, now that's not now with GPS and modern engines and all of that. This is 1874. We, by that time, had enough resources at our disposal so we could completely dominate the fish stocks in Lake Michigan. Okay, so what was happening? We were eating them all. The Friday night fish fry was a phenomenon even in 1874. And so the fish hatcheries were to uh, put more fish uh, back in the lakes. Okay, and why was this happening? Habitat destruction, industrial waste, and overfishing. Okay, the late 1800s and the early 1900s saw the proliferation of citizen boards. This was the progressive conservation era. Game laws were passed, game and fish wardens were hired, there were commissioners established to acquire park land, and the writings of men like Henry David Thoreau and Frederick Jackson Turner roused the national consciousness. And the inclusion of conservation as a cornerstone of Teddy Roosevelt's domestic policy wedded the conservation and the progressive movement together. And in Wisconsin, fighting Bob La Follette became governor of Wisconsin, and two years later appointed a, a non-salaried forestry commission, which hired the first state forester in Wisconsin, E.M. Griffith. Griffith was a former U.S. Forestry Department employee and a friend of Gifford Pinchot. So professional forestry arrived in Wisconsin in 1904 under the direction of a citizen board, okay? And their job, uh, um, in 1905, the Forestry Commission was replaced by a three-man unpaid forestry board, and that group's job was to hire the state forester, approve a budget, and set up a forest reserve. That group consisted of Charles Van Hise, and if any of you have ever been on the Madison campus, you know Van Hise Hall. That's named for Charles Van Hise, who was uh, the president of the University of Wisconsin. W.A. Henry, who was dean of the College of Agriculture at Madison, and Edward Burge, and I know those of you in the water resources end have heard of him. He was a prominent limnologist and on the faculty. And so this science involved in decision making was sort of early in the commissions and boards. In 1908, Teddy Roosevelt called the Governor's Conference on Conservation at the White House and incidentally, the 100 years later version of that, the White House, Con uh, White House Conference on Conservation, I was on the planning committee for that. So I got to be on the committee for the thing, the centennial version of that White House um, conference. And our governor, James Davidson, who th this is, returned from the conference so fired up that he appointed an advisory conservation commission to report on the um, state of natural resources in Wisconsin, okay? In 1915, Governor Emanuel, he's the crusty looking guy in the middle there, Governor Emanuel Phillips um, reorganized state government. Okay, this is another theme. Okay, what themes have we got out here? You know, uh, make, make more, take less is the last resort. And, um, proliferation of boards and commissions and getting lots of citizens involved around the turn of the last century. And now reorganization is the thing, okay? So this guy got, any time a new executive comes in, whether it is in government, whether it's in corporations, they want to put their thumbprint on how things are gonna go forward, okay? That's, that's a theme, it, it happens regularly. And in government, part of that is 
come, you, many of you are going to go to work for HMP. You're going to be part of the bureaucracy. Okay? The politicians come and go. Governors come and go. Like every four to 12 years, you know, they, they're, they're in, and, in and out. Those bureaucracy agency employees, they stay there for 30 years. Okay? Um, they, in the federal government, uh, they have a saying. You know, there's, a, there's, there's Class B employees, and those are like the civil service. There's Class C um, uh, employees, and those are like the political appointees who come and go every time a new president is elected. Those agency folks, the, the civil service employees, they say, this is the saying, we'll be, be here when you arrive, and we will see you when you leave. Okay? <laughs> so one of the things that happens when the executive, new executive comes in, they're trying to get control of you. Okay? And one of the ways they get control of you is shaking everything up putting new people in charge, getting rid of people, um, making you do a job you never did before. This is a, uh, an actual strategy for trying to get control of the bureaucracy. And over your 30-year career, you can expect to see this happen over and over again. Okay, everyone that ever, you wouldn't be governor if you didn't think you had a better idea than everybody else. You got a big ego. You're pretty sure you're pretty darn smart and you're pretty sure you're going to be able to fix everything once you get there. And so it's natural, right, that you're going to try to fix everything once you get there. So anyway, Emmanuel Phillip reorganized state government, and uh, all of the citizen boards were dissolved and replaced by a three-man conservation commission. And um, that went along for about 12 years. Um, and this was, he created a conservation department under the three-man paid conservation commission, okay? And the good thing here is there was a fisheries department, there was a wildlife department, there were the conservation wardens, and there were parks, and there were forests. All that stuff went in one pile and became the conservation department. And um, that was probably a good thing. This brought a higher level of organization and a higher level of professionalism and a higher level of people needing to work together on natural resources. That, that part was good. Okay, and it actually worked pretty well while Philip uh, was governor. Um, and then in 1921, Governor Blaine took office. Okay, so Philip had three scientists that were paid that ran the department, okay? So yeah, they were political appointees and they got paid, but they were all scientists and it all really went pretty well. Then in 1921, when Governor Blaine took office, he fired the commission and replaced the scientists with a political appointee. Now, I never knew this man, but, uh, his name was Elmer Hall, and he was from Green Bay, and he was described by the Green Bay Press Gazette as a politician who was out of work. Okay. And so that's when, uh, that's when the you-know-what hit the you-know-what, and the <laughs> conservation community really fired up. Um, there was a lot of widespread opposition to this, and um, Bill Aberg and uh, the guy in the middle, and Aberg Avenue in Madison is named after him. He was an attorney. Um, and Aldo Leopold, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And Aldo Leopold and other citizens got citizens together, and they convinced Fred Zimmerman to run against Blaine in the next election on a conservation reorganization platform. And... Um, he did get elected, and of course the legislature had to be involved in this. Governors can't do these things by themselves. And they created the Wisconsin Conservation Department under the direction of a six-person unpaid citizens board, okay? And the conservation lobby, this was a time of a, where conservation was huge in this state. Every one 
of the women's clubs had a conservation chair. The Federation of Women's Clubs had a conservation chair. There was one at the national level. They were giving money to the Forest Service to plant trees in the national forests. The Isaac Walton League was going around the state and having, you know, revival style meetings where you all come forward and be saved. And coming forward and being saved meant you were paying your dues and signing on the line to become a member of the Isaac Walton League. <laughs> you know, this is, a, so this was a really a big thing and conservation was really powerful, okay, at, in that time, okay. So uh, they got Zimmerman elected and then they gave him a list of who these six unpaid citizens should be. And guess what, he ignored the list and he put all of his political buddies in on the commission. Okay, and they threw him out in the next election. He lost the next election basically over that, um, over that issue. Okay, so down through the years then, um, more, more uh, it was decided, and Leopold was in this, that there needed to be more citizen involvement in natural resources decision making. Deer were a huge issue, okay? Lots of fighting over deer, just like today, except maybe <laughs> even worse. And, um, and actually, Leopold, we love him, you know, he's the father of wildlife management. They hated his cuts in parts of Wisconsin in that time frame because why he was advocating shooting does and, you know, I mean, there was the Save the Deer Committee and, you know, Vilas County and he was probably on their wanted poster, um, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so the, the Conservation Congress was started to get, and so some of you have probably been at the spring hearings or participated in the spring hearings, Conservation Congress was started to get more citizen input into natural resources decision making, and they're still here today. All right, well, we think that maybe the, the Natural Resources Board or the Conservation Commission has been a peaceful place through the years. Not necessarily so. There has been intrigue, you know, Ernie Swift left the state in the middle of, you know, a big uh, controversy. The Milwaukee Journal, um, there was a period of time where the, the Milwaukee Journal did a whole series of articles on um, graft and corruption in the Conservation Commission. Uh, so, you know, we like to think it was always peaceful, but it wasn't. There was, you know, there has been intrigue down through the years from time to time. Then in 1966, Warren Knowles, a conservation-minded individual with a vision for what? State reorganization was elected governor. And, um, when, and he was, this was when he was elected to his second term. And Wisconsin had blossomed into like 90 citizen boards in all aspects of government. And he started a group called the Kellett Commission to take a look at state government and make, uh, make recommendations for reorganization. And the, um, what they suggested doing was, at the time, we had a, a Department of Resource Development. Okay, that was the pollution side of the thing. Okay, air pollution, garbage, landfills, water uh, pollution, that was the agency that dealt with, it, it would have been like our state EPA, sort of, okay. Then there was the other side of the fence, which was the conservation side. That was the hunters and anglers, the, um, you know, the parks, the, for the romantic side of natural resources, the fish, the wildlife, the trees, the parks, that side, okay. So the Kellogg Commission suggested that those two be merged into one thing, a Department of Natural Resources. And um, so the other thing about reorganization is that whoever's being reorganized doesn't like it, okay? That, that's the other thing. So the, and the people, their clients, okay? So the romantic side of natural resources, who are their clients? Their clients, clients means interest groups or the citizens whose life is most closely aligned with that piece of government, okay? 
So hunters and anglers, you know, uh, the forestry community, those folks, they hated this. Why? And the other side, you know, they probably didn't like it either, the pollution side, the paper mills, the, because why? They've all spent decades cultivating each other. So the, the romantic side, they know what hunters and anglers want. They know what park uh, users want. And the park users and the hunters and anglers all know who to call in Madison to try to get their way on their side of what they want to have happen. So no one likes it when the cards all get flipped up in the air and nobody's going to know who's in charge. Nobody knows who to call. Nobody knows whether they're even going to still have a job or if they're even going to know anybody downtown anymore. No one likes it. But it, it moved forward, okay? And uh, the department, oh, the conservation department employees did a really naughty thing, okay? In those days, labor unions in Milwaukee were a really big deal, okay? And lots of big, in fact, labor unions still have conservation and hunting and fishing sort of department employees used their state telephones to call the union bosses in Milwaukee. And the union bosses in Milwaukee then organized an event called the Red Shirt, came to be called the Red Shirt Rebellion. Remember, your, your great grandfather if they hunted probably had a red and black, like a buffalo flag or a red and black plaid coat that they hunted in before labor so the red shirts took their deer rifles and they marched on the Capitol. Okay. And uh, I don't think any shots were fired, but the legislators looking out the window there at the sea of red shirts and they were armed, okay, were probably scared to death. And then they got mad and they passed I like to say that the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources was born out of armed rebellion in 1987. <laughs> um, and that ushered in the environmental decades, you know, the, a time when fisheries management and wildlife management and water pollution and air pollution were all handled in one what we refer to as a super department of natural resources. And uh, they had um, seven members with the, the board that, that the legislation says there is created under the direction and supervision of a board a department of natural resources. And there were seven members of that board. They served six year staggered terms, three from the north, three from the south, and one um, the line, this north-south line is Highway 10 through Cedar Point, just so you know. And I actually have a story about that. When uh, it came time for me to be appointed to the Natural Resources Board, Governor Doyle people called me. I was actually in Missoula, Montana for a Health Foundation board meeting, and they wanted to immediately meet the governor and the mayor board so we could make this announcement. Well, I wasn't able to do that because I wasn't here. Um, but it was a, the Democrats were in charge for the first time in like 15 years. Because Tommy Thompson, a really popular governor, was governor for, I think, into his fourth term. And then he went to D.C. to become Secretary of Health and Human Services. And oh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Took, took over. And uh, so the Democrats had not been in charge of the executive office for that long a time. So nobody knew what to do. I mean, because no one had, you know, no one had been doing it. You know, anybody who was doing it prior to Thompson was probably retired or left the state or uh, whatever. So um, when they called me, they thought I was from the North because I was from Cedar Point. 
they thought. But I live in Clover. <laughs> so I'm one mile south of the line okay, that goes through there. And that really flummoxed them because they had a specific seat they wanted me to take. Um, and I mean, they called back numerous times. Well, don't you have a cabin up north or something? <laughs> and I mean, they're just trying to shoehorn me into this other seat. But no, okay, so I'm from the south, north and south, and one at large. Okay, and things went along like that till about 1995 when um, Governor Thompson got control of everything in the state because the state legislature became controlled by his party. I, these are not partisan comments I'm making. You know, I interviewed almost all the governors who had served since 1967, and I would tell you that all but one of them would have done the same thing if they could have, okay? They just didn't have the chance because when they were governor, at least part of the legislature was controlled by the other team, okay? But, but in 1995, Republicans took control of the legislature and we had a Republican governor. So Tommy Thompson um, took control of the Department of Natural Resources. The legislation got changed and the, the secretary became a cabinet position. Now all this time since, and there have been several renditions of, of legislation that have affected the organization of the Department of Natural Resources. Now, a certain number of board members have to be hunters, and one has to be in agriculture. So there are things that have changed. The role of the board has, has changed. By the new board doesn't hire and fire the secretary. The governor does. But in all of the renditions of change, they never change that first sentence. There is created, under the direction and supervision of a board, a department of natural resources. Then they go on to say that the secretary is a cabinet position. Well, it's a cabinet position, but the legislation still says that the board is supervising, directing and supervising the department. So it's a gray area. It probably should get sorted out. Um, and it's a place where controversy can happen and where people can, can uh, be not sure what is their exact role from a legal standpoint. Okay, so uh, the board lost the power to hire and fire the secretary. Um, so who serves on boards? Academics and you know uh, citizens who like parks and farmers and people who hunt and you know, uh, real estate moguls. I mean, there, there's a whole variety uh, of people. Um, and we do, what does the board do? We set policy and fish and wildlife management, or they do. Uh, we, uh, they make environmental policy. And one of the biggest things I think that I think we did when I was on the board is we purchased land. And we add land to the state uh, um, real estate roles. And I think that's really important uh, because it makes a place, it's one of the reasons we're a beautiful place. No one's going to Gary, Indiana for vacation, okay? Um, people are moving here from places like Cleveland because yeah. it's so beautiful here. You know, and one of the reasons that it is is because we have a lot of public land. We have federal land, state land. We have beautiful parks right here in Stevens Point. And so I think one of the big important roles of the board has been overseeing the land purchases that have been done by the department. Um, but I think the biggest thing that the board does and has done is increase citizen involvement and participation in, in natural resources decision making. The governor can call the secretary over to the Capitol and close the door. The legislature can go into caucus and no one can be there. The secretary can meet with his staff any day of the week in private meetings and you don't even know the meeting's happening. If two or more board members go to the restroom, it has to be noticed up as a public meeting. Okay, so this is the only place where citizens can be sure
sure that the discussion is by law has to happen in the public eye. And I think that is the actual real value of, uh, of this. Okay, so I'm gonna step back now and, and open it up for questions. What do you wanna talk about? You wanna talk about what's happening on the Natural Resources Board right now? I won't criticize anybody, I think it's bad form, but we can talk in genera generalities. Um, you wanna talk about wolves? I mean, what would you like to talk? You wanna talk about my, my experiences? Uh, you want me to tell stories? You know, what would you like? Go ahead. Um, I have a question about your, not opinion about what should have been done, but what you think is legal, I guess, related to the most recent wolf quota issue, where the Natural Resources Board set a quota and then the department um, set their own quota. Okay. All right. So this is a sticky subject. Um, yeah, sorry. And, uh, and I'm going to do my best with, with this. And understand, you're getting my opinion, and I'm not a judge. And the, you know, the cases haven't been tried in front of me, right? Um, so, um, and let's just start with wolves in general, OK? I was on the board when the first wolf season got set. And um, we met, we had a special meeting in July at the Holiday Inn. And our act together and get things done uh, because the legislature said there will be a season. Okay, and they actually laid out almost every parameter of that season. Method of take, uh, night hunting, dogs, everything. Um, the department really job was to set the quotas in the, ver the, the areas where this would happen and the quotas in those areas only leeway that the department had. Everything else was was laid right out in the legislation. So very little authority to make decisions, just in those two areas. It was my worst day on the Natural Resources Board. 62 people, I think, approximately came to speak, were packed in a tight room. Citizens are sitting on the floor peeping around us. They called us names. Um, the, you know, we had a job to do, and, you know, my personal opinion really didn't have anything to do with it. It was a, a job that was laid out, and the parameters were narrow, and we had a thing to do. And no matter what you did, half the people in the room were going to be really angry, because they really, some of them really believed that we got to get rid of a bunch of wolves, that, you know, it's affecting my way of life, and et cetera. The rest of the people in the room thought they're spiritual beings, they're my brother, and, you know, you as a board member, you have to take everybody at face value. They're telling you, you have to believe they're telling you what you believe, they believe. But you still had a job to do. Okay, so with that as the backdrop, through the years, then the wolves went back on the list, and they came off the list, they went back on the list, they came off the list for one season, for more seasons, and uh, this year there was supposed to be a season, and um, it was just as contentious as it ever was for all the same reasons. There isn't like a middle ground to condense that. That's not like partially there. So uh, you know, there's no place for a compromise. And the, the department came along with a recommendation and the board did something else. And they get to do that. They get to do something else if they want to. Um, and then in the end, when the season got announced, the department approved the season with their recommendation, the department's recommendation and not the one that the board, I think I got this right, the one that the board so I think that I don't I think it all died. Nobody challenged that part in court, I don't think. Um, but it, it became moot anyway. There wasn't a season. Um, but the, the department um, the what this is what I think. The legislation says what? There is created under the direction
direction and supervision of a board, a department of natural resources. And so I think that the department did not have the authority, if it was a Christian Thomas's opinion, okay, to do something different with that than what the board said. And again, I don't think that's been litigated, at least not to its conclusion. Does that answer your question? Yes. Can I further comment? Uh, and this is strictly for my reading. Currently, there cannot be a wolf season. Going back to 1994, the department at that time established a supposed quota of 350 wolves in the state. Pending is a wolf management plan, which would be implemented if Representative Tiffany's bill pending in Congress that can clarify and allow for the states to manage their wolves. That's, I think, in a committee. But what is a uh, point of contention between both sides is, let's say the uh, legislation passes and a wolf season becomes approved, will the DNR put a quota number in your regulations, uh, and that's, well, that's what highly this, debatable. That's what this issue was basically about. And so taking that uh, national, he just threw a national spin in here. When I was on both the Sporting Conservation Council and the Wildlife Hunting and Heritage Conservation Council, the wolf issue was also on our plate, okay? And um, those councils, who were dominated by uh, conservation group leaders, hunters, and um, state agency people, basically, um, advocated for um, letting the states make their own decisions. So that would be, which is why wild, there's no place in the Constitution where it says wildlife is the purview of the federal government. Okay? There are some legislation, like the Lacey Act, Migratory Bird Act, Etc., where the federal government does get involved, Endangered Species Act, in wildlife management. In general, it's the purview of the state. Okay? And so that was our, the councils that I was on, that was the, the, the advice that we gave the secretary. Of course, they didn't get to say because Congress gets to say about things like this. Um, our advice was the state should be allowed to manage wildlife in their state. That's what the North American model is about. So that it's just throwing the, you know. And so some folks would like to see people like Tom Tiffany pick up this issue and have Congress decide wildlife management issues. Now they will be happy with that, okay? Remember, that's not, in general, wildlife is not the purview of the federal government. They will be happy with that until the other team takes control of Congress and the decision that gets made is then not the decision that they like. And so that's the two-edged sword in policy making at the federal level as it relates to wildlife. That's true at the state level as it relates to wildlife. One of the good things about the good old days when the board hired and fired the secretary is there was just a little more wiggle room between the secretary and the governor and the secretary and the legislature, which sometimes allowed the resource to be the thing that was most considered as opposed to the resource user, okay? And, um, but you know, when the legislature or when Congress makes wildlife management policy, you're happy as long as your team is the one that's in there. As soon as the other team's in there, then you're not so happy because they're not, then not doing what you want to have done. Okay, other questions, go ahead. Yeah, along those lines, um, from your experience, has it ever been where people will not step down uh, and or that the legislators don't pick up uh, nominations for, for the board? That happened to me. <laughs> and it also happened to Jane Wiley and this is the third time that I know of. Yeah, there it is. But the 
there wasn't a court case. And there's a court case right now, and I think that uh, decision is supposed to come out next month for whether or not the person can over, the question there is, um, unless the legis uh, until a person is confirmed, can I still stay in my seat? That's the question. And we'll potentially find out the answer to that next month. Other This is so easy. Um, my favorite thing that I got to do when I was on the Natural Resources Board was during the spring and summer months, like, like maybe, maybe May until October, the board goes on what I call the road show. Okay? So we, uh, we go out to the, we hold our meetings in the region, and we do a, a field trip the day before the board meeting to go look at management activities in, in the region, and then usually like a picnic or something like that, and then the next day was the board meeting. And there might be a special listening session, like we had one on snowmobiles once in northwestern Wisconsin, and we had one on wolves once. Um, but the favorite part was the field trip. Because why? Because when I went out on the field trip, I got to see my former students making presentations on the cool management things that they were doing. I remember a Mississippi River trip where one of my students, you know, was the speaker for the we're on this barge going down the Mississippi River, and one of my students is talking about fish management in the Mississippi River. And so that was my favorite part, getting to see our students out there in their agency life doing cool things. And, and of course, every time a pointer was in front of the board, I was cheering and <laughs> carrying on. You know, the rest of the board probably got sick of me. But uh, anyway, that was my favorite part. from one dean to another. It was not an underhand softball toss. Get out of your comfort zone, okay? So uh, it's just, honestly, you know, it's just easier to talk to the people you know and to go right to your room at the end of the day and look at stuff on your iPad, okay? So, I mean, that's the comfortable thing to do. Get out of your comfort zone and um, talk to people you don't know and listen to the things they have to say and get skilled at uh, at not giving your opinion all the time. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, Steve Menzel and I raised a lot of money when we were here. We didn't, we never once offered a political opinion on any subject with any person that we were talking to because they're stupid. No. So, you know, it's yeah, uh huh, yeah, uh huh, and even if you totally disagree, just grin and not. You know, don't, uh, don't get into it. So, yeah, I think, you know, you got to, you got to know when to speak up and when not to speak up. And you, you listen to what other people have to say. Meet as many people as you can. Get yourself out of your comfort zone. And um, I would have goals when you go places. What are the list of people you want to make sure you see? And what is it you're trying? Know what you're trying to do when you go there. What is it that you're gonna that you're trying to accomplish? You know, the, the, the first day I went to the Boone and Crockett Club, somebody in, uh, invited, a person who was chair of the Elk Foundation board when I was on the board invited me to come and be a professional member. And uh, at the time, I thought I wanted to be the Boone and Crockett chair at Missoula, you know? So I, uh, and I told them that right straight up. When Jack Ward Thomas uh, retires, I'm your girl. You know, I'm uh, <laughs> interested, but you know, that's not how it turned out, and that isn't really the goal that I ended up even having. But I did have the goal 
of raising money to support natural resources activities for students and faculty here in the College of Natural Resources, and we accomplished some of that with the Bruin Project Club. So I think those are kind of the, the things that I would, would say. Step, step out of your comfort zone, meet people, know what you're trying to do, and, um, and do it. Okay, thank you very much. You've been a great audience.